Just before sunrise, the sun lightly kisses the temple, causing it to become a beautiful pink color. At the center of the facade is a god known as Rahorakti, meaning Horus of the Horizon. In a smaller figure next to Ramses is his chief wife, Nefertari. On the opposite side is Ramses' mother, Mut Toy. Tied up below their feet are the African captives. By building this temple in Nubia and showing the captives, Ramses was sending out a strong message. The captives were from Nubia, Kush, Meroe, Libya, and beyond. There is a change on the opposite side below Ramses and Nefertari. These are the tied-up captives of the North, identified by their unique hairstyles. Canaanites, Hittites, Assyrians, Persians, and more. Ramses clearly showed the Egyptians as in charge. The different forms of Horus are lined up, attentively guarding the temple. Out of all the relocated temples, Abu Simbel was the most unique and challenging. It was raised 65 meters higher and 200 meters back, each block cut by hand. The entire Abu Simbel relocation project took over eight years to complete. Astonishingly, even the two mountains it was originally carved in was recreated. The temple was commissioned after Ramses' Battle of Kadesh, and took over 20 years to complete. Ramses pleasing Amun was the ancient name. Now it is called Abu Simbel because in 1813, when explorers were led here by a young boy, his name was Simbel. The temple now means the father of Simbel. As we walk past the colonnade wall here, Ramses is sitting on either side of the temple and as Osiris. It's amazing to have this temple all to myself at sunrise because I get to witness the phenomenon of the sunrise on the statues of Ramses, Amun, Sita, and Ra. The sun bursts through the entrance on two days a year, 21st of February and 21st of October, marking the Pharaoh's birth and his coronation. Amun Min anointed with oil by Ramses on the side, with other images of the Pharaoh giving offerings to the gods. In the sanctum, a barge containing a statue of Ramses as Amun would be placed. It was here that Ramses fully became a god. On this site, he wanted to remind us of his greatest achievements. Possibly his most iconic scene, the Battle of Kadesh. Ramses on his horse and chariot, shooting his bow and arrow out towards the fortress of the Hittites. He fought in so many victorious battles, starting from the reign of his father. But the one battle that Ramses was most proud of was Kadesh. The echoes in here without a single soul. You can just imagine when the priests came in here burning incense for Ramses, how that would have sounded. Passing scenes like this 
passing scenes like this one, with Ramses II smiting enemies from all nations before the Almighty God, Amun. It is absolutely breathtaking. Ramses on his chariot with his horse after a victorious battle, returning with Mahes, his pet lion, the lion that we've seen depicted throughout the temples along the now Lake Nasser. Mahes leaping forward, mouth open, tongue out with joy. Mahes's name means the one who is beside him. This is probably one of my favorite scenes, and people forget about this beautiful, majestic animal that fought in war with Ramses. Before them, we have Ramses' army approaching with their bows, and before them, the captives. These are Nubian captives, bound around the neck and the arms, with Ramses leading them in to the city. On the other side, we can see the Egyptians training Mahes, taken to the battle of Kadesh. The entire battle is documented in this temple. Ramses' issue with the Hittites started back in the reign of his father Seti. Seti won for a brief time, but by the time of Ramses, he wanted to take control. En route to Kadesh, Ramses' men captured two Hittite spies. Pharaoh's men tortured them, wanting to learn the truth about Mutawalis, the king of the Hittites, and his location. The men were brought before Ramses. They told Ramses that Mutawalis was 200 kilometers north. Ramses' men continued forward, set up a camp just outside Kadesh across the river, now in modern-day Turkey. However, Ramses was deceived. The two men had lied, and Ramses and his men were ambushed from the Hittites across the river. The Egyptians were outnumbered. It looked like defeat. The Egyptians fought valiantly, but then another Egyptian unit arrived, and they were able to chase the Hittites back across the river. Both sides retreated for the night. At camp, Ramses received a letter from Mutawalis asking for a draw, since Ramses had killed the Hittite's son. The next day, Ramses and his injured army set out for the stronghold of Kadesh. The city was perfectly placed between the river. The faster Egyptian chariots encircled the city, perfectly illustrated here. The battle was chaos. They seemed evenly matched. After hours of fighting, Many Hittites were dead in the river, and many Egyptians were killed. Ramses returned back to Egypt as the victor. The total severed hands of the fallen vile Hatti, as Ramses referred to them, were presented to the pharaoh. Some historians say this was boastful, and that the battle was a draw, Yet the Hittites wrote letters to Ramses referring to themselves as your servant. If they won, why would they refer to themselves as this? Nevertheless, Ramses II was a great warrior and fought in countless successful battles throughout his empire. Ramsay's legacy does not only spread to the battlefield, he also had many wives and produced almost 200 children. This side we have Ramsay's sons, his firstborn sons, starting with Amun Herkepshef and ending here. Many sons that would ultimately go into battle with Ramsay's. In scenes here, we can see three of Ramsay's sons that accompanied him into battle. It was quite a family operation for Ramses II. 
The young princes are indicated from the side lock of hair, here with his brothers, his name written out, Amun Her Kep Shef. This temple is to commemorate Ramsay's war efforts, showing him, smiting, his enemy, he's in battle, killing a Libyan man, and over here, stepping on the head of the enemy. This prolific warrior wanted to show what he did. He fought in so many battles. He lived until he was 96. Ramses II, showing himself here as a living god, all-powerful. And the god that is worshipped in this temple is on this wall, right over here. We can see Ramses II offering two jars of wine with his name, Usar Mahedra, written here. And another special god, now not seated with a triad of other gods, but as a single deity, wearing the ram's horn of Amun. This god's name is indicated over here. It is Ramses II. Ramses giving offerings to Ramses. Because by this point in his life, he had retired from militaristic actions and took a more religious and political role. And for that, his sons became part of the military and Ramses then was deified. Although this is not the first time, many pharaohs were deified. Above, we can see where Ramses II had his coronation at Jebel Barco, down in Sudan, just a few kilometers from here. There's Ramses standing before the serpent coming out of the mound. That signifies the sacred mound of Amun in Nubia. Visually, Amun is distinct from his crown with two feathers. He often appears with blue skin as he was the hidden god, the god that was always present. Amun had many roles in ancient Egypt. He was the supreme god, the king over all gods. He was connected with the strength of the ram, which is why Ramses often wears the ram's horn of Amun. Lord of truth, father of the gods, maker of men, creator of all animals, all things great and small, Lord of things that are, creator of the key of life. This is how Ramses referred to Amun, even including him in his birth name. He is always shown in the company of the gods, like the fierce lioness goddess Sekhmet, the one who symbolized strength in war. Apart from the god of the living, Amun, Ramses also connected himself to the god of the dead, Osiris. Ramses becoming Osiris, becoming a god, meaning he will be reborn and live forever. In the main temple at Abu Simbel is my favorite scene. Well, second favorite scene. I'll show you my favorite in a moment. We have Nefertari shaking sistrums before Ramses, giving an offering of incense to the gods. But Nefertari shown tall and slender, beautifully depicted in full color in this temple. On the other side, we have the god Amun Lin, shown with his erect penis, the god of fertility. Behind him is Ramses II with Hathor. Hathor here would actually be Nefertari because both of these royals were deified within the space. My absolute favorite scene inside Abu Simbel is this one. It is Ramses with the goddess Mut. Yet, Mut over here is again Nefertari. Nefertari is holding him behind the head, pulling him in by the arm, ready 
to give him a kiss. It is so touching, so beautiful, so romantic. Exactly how Ramses II was with his wife. Their religion was based on balance, and we can see the balance here between female and male gods blessing Ramses. We know that the ancient Egyptians held women in high regard, and Ramses was no exception to this. A rare scene shows Nefertari as a young woman with the side lock of youth shaking the sistrum before Hathor. Nefertari and Ramses had met when they were around 13 years old, before Ramses became Pharaoh. Nefertari was not only Ramses' wife, she was his companion. She was trained by Ramses' mother to be the best wife and the best queen possible. We see them performing many rituals together. The second columned hall features Ramses in intimate, direct scenes with the gods. Montu, the Theban god of war, offering the key of life to Ramses, gently touching it to his nose. Montu's hand reaches to the back of the pharaoh, supporting his head, supporting him in his efforts. The protector of Pharaoh on earth, Horus supports a smiling Ramses. The doorway before the sanctuary shows the Pharaoh performing his jubilee rites, and hidden in complete shadow is the mysterious god Ptah. Opposite is Khnum. Ptah was the god of craftsmen. Khnum was the god that crafted your destiny. These two came together and formed the destiny for the then deified king. The outside of this temple contains a closer look at the life of this pharaoh. A chapel dedicated to the god of wisdom is on the side of this magnificent structure. A head of Ramses lays in the sand. It broke off during antiquity in an earthquake. Commemorating a Hittite princess union, many stelae such as this around the temple give us an insight into his reality. Possibly the saddest scene here at Abu Simbel is on a stela on the side. It is showing Nefertari seated on a throne, enclosed by a canopy canopy that usually was associated with death. We see Ramses II with their daughter Merit Amun offering to the gods. Now Fitari is seated below because at this point she had already died. This is just one of many everyday scenes, if we can call it that, of Ramses on the outside. Some stealers show Ramses with his son receiving offerings. Next to Nefertari's temple are other stela as well. The prince is identified through the feather scepter. The viceroy of Kush bows before the pharaoh. And of course a stela glorifying Ramses in battle, one of the longest ruling pharaohs of all time. Though just a few steps away is the second temple, dedicated to Ramses' love of his life, Nefertari. She is one of just a few queens to have an entire temple dedicated to her by her husband and pharaoh. The smaller temple at Abu Simbel, yet it's the more beautiful one. It's the first time I've ever been in here by myself. I have time to observe the face of Hathor, the face of Nefertari, 
inside this beautiful temple. But my favorite scene is further down here. It is the inner sanctum with the statue of Hathor coming out. Nefertari underneath the chin of Hathor. Over here is Ramses giving offerings to both of them. And around the side over here is Ramses and Nefertari seated on the throne of Egypt, shown at the same height, shown as equals. This scene would suggest that Nefertari was a co-regent with Ramses at one point. She was in charge of the politics when her husband was away at war. One event would cause Ramses to change everything. While he was away, there was an attempted attack on Nefertari. Nefertari even accompanied Ramses II into several battles. A strong woman behind her even stronger husband. She's shown here supporting him, wearing a beautiful dress, with the long hair and the beautiful looped earrings. Next to her is Ramses smiting his enemy. They are quite, quite a team, I would say. On the other side of the temple, we can see another scene of Ramses and the Fatari at battle, this time not with the people of Amaru, but the people of Nubia. Ramses smiting the Nubian man by holding it up by his hair. This smiting was overseen by Amun, who offers Ramses his sword. And the beautiful Nefertari, shown wearing a short wig, again supporting her husband. And we know that she accompanied him on at least two battles. She was quite a phenomenal woman. A very strong female presence is in this temple, not only through the gods, but through Nefertari's image repeated over and over. She wears the mother goddess crown of Mut. Ramses shown wearing the horns of Amun, connecting these two spiritually. The king holds out incense. This act would have been for eternity, as when people walk down the center, he's burning incense for the offerings coming to his great royal wife. Nefertari selected the other wives for Ramses. We can see that these two had a strong bond, not only for their love, but for their country. Above the queen is the name of Ramses, and above Ramses is the name of the queen. They were equal. Inside Nefertari's temple, with the columned hall with Hathor and Ramses and Nefertari repeated several times, we see Ramses giving offerings to the gods to ensure a peaceful life for him and his wife. We see Nefertari again shaking the sistrum before Hathor, with Ramses right behind Hathor, wearing the horns of Amun offering to Ra. In this hallway here, we can see Ramses giving an offering on this side to Hathor, shown in the barge, yet repeated on the other side of this temple is Nefertari performing the exact same role as her pharaoh husband, Ramses II. Here is Nefertari offering lotus and papyrus to Hathor on the barge in the marshes. The crowning of Nefertari. Here we see Hathor, we see Isis, and they are placing the crown, the crown of Mut, upon a young Nefertari. In this way, they are 
showing, they are proving that Nefertari has become a goddess. We know that Ramses was not born of a royal family line. He was born in the north, in Avaris. Nefertari was born in Luxor, in Thebes, or Waset. There is slight evidence to suggest that Nefertari's family were of noble origins in Thebes. She was the perfect wife for Ramses. Not only beautiful, not only intelligent, she could secure Ramses' future to becoming a fully-fledged god. By marrying a woman of such stature, it proved to the gods and the public that he was worthy. Ramses II showed with the god Set, the god of chaos. They are both here because on the other side we have Horus, the balance, making the pharaoh a balanced ruler, showing the chaos and the justice coming together. And of course, Ramses II was born in Avaris, a Hyksos capital, where the god Set was revered. Even Ramses' father's name was Seti. So this is a rare image of seeing Set and Horus placing the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt on the pharaoh. Here, Ramses writes a dedication where he says that Nefertari is the one for whom the sun shines. He wanted to show the importance of his wife, and thus he put these two statues of her on the facade at the same height as himself. Standing next to their parents are the children of Ramses and Nefertari. Here is a young prince. On this side is another young prince, shown with their beautiful side lock of youth. And what's interesting is, beneath the father, we have the sons. And next to the mother, we have the daughters. And here are Ramses and Nefertari's daughters, the young princesses. It's heartbreaking that Nefertari never saw these temples completed, as they reflect her name, the most beautiful of them all. <laughs>